Karunang karuna tarangi takshi Drita pa shankusha kushpa bana chapam Anima di bira vritam mayu kahai Raham mityeva vibhavaye Bhavani Mano rupe kshukodanda panchatan matrasayaka Nijaruna prabhapura majjad brahmanda mandala Namaste and welcome to the next episode of Lalita Sahasranam. This Lalita Sahasranam is so powerful. I know a lot of people think that it's too technical or too foreign or something or other. Anyway, they more like to watch the videos where I'm just rapping. <laughs> but actually, how did I get to the place where I can rap like that? It was through chanting mantras like Lalita Sahasranam. And so in this episode, we want to cover the next verse, verse 3. The last time we started discussing Manuro Pekshukodanda, huh? Nama 10. And what this means is that the mind has different states. And we talked about sankalpa, which is desire, and vikalpa, which is differentiation, discrimination, uh, the awareness of differences. And of course, this is duality. <laughs> this is abrahma. This is not brahman, huh? because brahman is one. Brahman is non-dual. I don't want to say... Uh, one oneness exactly because if there's only one who's to keep, who's to keep score <laughs> there's nothing to count so it's not even one it's non-dual no differences but in the manifestation in the world there are differences and this is how we perceive things we perceive them by the differences between one thing and another so then Beyond Sankalpa and Vikalpa, there's Nirvikalpa. And Nirvikalpa means no differences. So in that state, we don't know if we're perceptic or not. And from this comes the eighth jhana of the Buddha, neither perception nor non-perception. Because if one is simply in emptiness, or to put it in a positive sense, pure consciousness, pure awareness without an object, pure subjectivity, no objects, huh? then one does not know whether he is perceptive or not. There's no way to tell. How do you know? <laughs> so this is the doorstep to enlightenment. This is the, uh, the last stage before self-realization. So these three states, Sankalpa, Vikalpa, Nirvikalpa, are the uh, primary states of the mind. And we want to uh, emphasize that the form of the goddess has all of these states encoded into it. We're going to begin in the next few episodes discussing the form of Lalita. And we discuss her form. We already started talking about her different weapons in her different arms, huh? her four arms. And this particular ma mantra, Manu Rupek Chakodanda, it talks about her bow, her sugarcane bow. And what she's doing with this sugarcane bow is shooting arrows 
of flowers. Huh? <laughs> what an image. Of course, sugarcane, if you crush it, if you, you put it through a press, you get sugar juice, which is very sweet and nice. And if you boil down this sugar juice, you get gur, raw sugar, which is extremely nutritious and wonderful taste also. <laughs> so the next name, Panchatan Matra Sayaka, talks about these arrows. Pancha means five, Sayaka means arrows. And Tanmatra means the five elements, Akasha or space, then uh, air, fire, water, and earth. And each of these um, directly maps to one of our five senses. Akasha conducts sound, so it's the object for hearing. And then fire has light, so it reveals form, which is the object for seeing. Earth conducts smell, aroma. Huh? Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, I am the original aroma of the earth. So that's our sense of smell. And water, of course, carries taste. And finally, air carries touch, because when the wind blows, you can feel it on your skin. So the five senses, hearing, seeing, smelling, tasting, and touching, are carried by the five elements. These are the tan matra. Uh -huh. So the panchatan matra are her sayaka, her arrows. And this is how she controls everybody. This is how she manipulates everybody. This is how she forces everyone to experience the results of their karma. So when she fires her, her arrows, huh, her arrows are sweet, becoming from the sugarcane bow. And nobody can resist this, you see. So this is why she is the supreme and she is always in control of everyone. Panchatan Matra Sayaka. So she has two uses for these arrows and bows. She, one is that she benedicts her devotees and the other one is that she annihilates her enemies. So all of the different uh, people and beings in the universe are controlled by her, either positively or negatively. The demons are afraid of her, but the devotees love her because they recognize that all the inputs of the senses are actually her energy. Uh, she's in control of these panchatan matra, the five elements. So everything that we perceive in any sense is her energy. And when we recognize this, then we're overwhelmed with love for her because that means that she's intimately involved. Huh? She cares about us and she has a personal relationship with each of us. So this is a wonderful thing, of course. And there's something more hidden in this name. And it's a little technical, so I have to read it. The last three namas, Krodha Karan Kushojvala, Mano Rupekshukodanda, and Panchatan Matra Sayaka have secret bijas encoded within them. Uh -huh. And I'm going to give one example. In Nama 8, Raga Swarupa Pashadya, the Hring bija is encoded in this name. And the way it is explained here, it begins with ragaswa, which is formed from ra, aga, swa. Aga means Shiva, and the bija for Shiva is hung. So this is to be taken as ha. And the next letter is ra, which is to be taken as it is. Ra in and of itself is a powerful bija. The name of God, Rama, for example, is very powerful and can lead to development of mystic powers because of the power of Ra. 
And this is to be taken as it is. And then sva means the letter ing, bija ing, which is e with a dot over it. The bija ing is extremely powerful because it causes the fructification of any mantra that it's a part of. So bija ing, even if you meditate on it by itself, is very powerful. But when combined with these other letters, forms the bija hring. Hring bija is also called maya bija, and it is the power of shakti. This is the mantra, this is the bijam that invokes her presence. For example, in the Panchadashi mantra, there are three kutas, or parts, three lines, and they describe her head, body, and feet, respectively. See, the form of the goddess is always described from the head down to the feet. So the three kutas of Panchadashi mantra, which of course is included in Mahasodashi mantra, each of them ends with hring. So first, Kuta describes her head and then hring, then her body and hring and her legs and feet and hring. So this invokes the presence of the goddess within one's mind. <laughs> and this is so wonderful. You have to try this. I mean, I'm amazed that people listen to these videos and they don't actually do the practices that re, re, uh, give these wonderful realizations. So anyway, the bija ring is hidden in this name, Ragaswarupa Pashadya. And similarly, the other bijas of the other two, uh, of the three uh, kutas, which are da, ra, ka, la, ya, sva, va, a, e, and U are hidden within these three names. So we're not going to go into the technical details of how they're hidden. The point is that their influence is there. And by chanting these names, one can feel that influence directly and realize it. So this is the power of the thousand names, you see. It's not simply a ritual. It's not just a prayer. It's not something that, um, just a form that people do in a dry way. Uh, although I'm sure there are people that approach it like that. But it's more than that. See, in bhakti, when one realizes the sweetness of these names, then the mind is attracted towards the object of devotion spontaneously. And there's no need for effort, no need to force the mind to meditate on the object or the deity. But the mind is attracted naturally because of the sweetness, huh? the sugarcane bow and the flower arrows in her hands. So the next name is number 12. Nijaruna Prabhapura Majjad Brahmanda Mandala. That her form being red, uh, and everything connected with her is red. One of her names is Sarvaruna, which means everything is red. <laughs> this form and the color of the form permeate the entire creation. Uh, so just like one of the previous names described her form being similar to thousands of rising suns, coming up in the sky at the same time with their red color, huh? the beautiful red color. And similarly, the entire universe is actually reflecting her red color. And this happens, for example, when she sits on Shiva's lap. Shiva's complexion is naturally clear, crystalline, white. Huh? But when she sits on his lap, he becomes reddish by the reflection of her. Uh, complexion. Just like if you take these crystal beads and you put them next to something red, they'll turn red. Uh -huh. So her influence is everywhere, even through uh, the, the form of Shiva. So this is why 
these uh, mantras are so powerful, they carry her influence. Even if one is not directly aware of the power of the bijas hidden in the mantras, still they have their effect because they were put there by the intention of the authors. The author of the Lalita Sahasranam are the Vach Devis. Vach Devis mean the goddesses of speech. They composed this thousand names at the request of Lalitambika. And they are, of course, the experts of putting hidden meanings in everything. So this Sahasranam is actually on the level of the Vedas. It's very esoteric, very deep, and very powerful. And simply by chanting these names, one gets all the benefits up to and including the highest enlightenment. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Shakti Aum.